and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, remember the hype about self-driving cars from like 10 years ago? Like that really died out. Can I tell you something? <laughs> yeah. I'm still holding out hope for the self-driving cars because oh. I, I can't drive. And oh. it was kind of <laughs> I forgot it about was that. kind of acceptable when I was in my 20s, but now it's starting to get a little embarrassing. So I really need the self-driving cars to um, become viable options. So when we go on the road and like do podcasts like in another city. You have to drive. I have to drive all the time, don't I? I hadn't, it hadn't, because I think I've asked you, I'm like, oh, Tracy, are you renting a car? And then you like sort of change the discussion or you bring up something else. <laughs> like, oh, I, I think there's Ubers in that town or something. But this is the real reason, isn't it? Well, I mean, there are Ubers everywhere. You yeah. know what we should talk about, whether or not Ubers have uh, decreased enthusiasm for self-driving cars as a business mm. model. Remember when people used to say Uber would never make any money if they still had to pay humans, but now they're making <laughs> a little money. It's true. But I do think like generally, like when people talk about like tech that didn't live up to the hype mm. and that you see it now with like chatbots and stuff like that and whether they're really going to change, like people go back to the self-driving cars. Like to me, yes. that's the sort of quintessential example of the like modern times, maybe 3D printing. You don't really hear that much about it. Yes. But don't you also find it weird to imagine a future in two or 300 years where there wouldn't be self-driving cars? It, oh, yeah. it feels at once both inevitable and like yeah. hype, if that makes sense, like an artificiality. No, I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely agree. 200, 300 years. That's a, like, that's a long time. Like 50 years from now, I've kind of. You think 50 years from now? Well, so this is the question, which is like my, I is not an area I know that well. But my impression is it's like a like sort of classic thing where like tech got us like 95% of the way there. And then there are some edge cases that make self-driving cars difficult. I don't know exactly what they are, but that getting that last 5% or whatever is so hard that it renders the whole thing very difficult. And that whatever that last percent is, is the difference between the tech being like, wow, versus actually changing the world. We are so close and yet so far. Yeah, it's one of those things. And I feel like, again, with chatbots and some of these other like current like artificial intelligence applications, it comes back to this question of like, yes, it's really great and it sort of blows your mind, but there are these hallucinations, another thing. And like, if it's not 99.9%, if it's not 100% yeah. reliable, does that mean it really won't be as disruptive as people expect? Well, the other thing I'm curious about is whether or not that sort of last 5% that you're describing, whether that's on the software or the hardware side. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I think that I, has implications for, you know, if we do make huge leaps in artificial intelligence, maybe that solves a software problem. But maybe the issue is actually that the sensors are too basic or yeah. too expensive, um, that sort of thing. I don't know the answer to any of these questions. The one other thing I'll say too is like, there is a lot of car talk these days. We've been doing more and more on the podcast. It's entirely like on the sort of EV charging side and how are EVs and how EV production and batteries, like how are they going to reshape the industry or Chinese exports? How are they going to reshape the industry? It does not seem like, again, 10 years ago, the big question was like, who's ahead in the self-driving car race? Google, GM or Ford, there was much less talk then about EVs as the big disruptor. Right. So I think it is time for a checkup, right, on what's going on with self-driving cars. It is time for a checkup. And our guest says they're back, that they're happening for real. And I do believe him to some extent because I follow some people who live in San Francisco and they're tweeting about it more and more that they see them on the road. And sometimes when I'm up at four in the morning to read the internet in the dark and drink coffee, I see like people who are still out at night in San Francisco talking about all the self-driving cars around them. So there might actually be, it may not be totally over. There might be, they might be back. Well, the things I see on the internet about self-driving cars oh, yeah. are those edge cases where it's yes. like a car flummoxed by a traffic cone in the middle of the street, yeah, um, the which they're simultaneously like impressive and amusing and disappointing all at the same time, if that makes sense. It's interesting. You're very pro self-driving cars. I didn't. I, it hadn't clicked. Like You really want this to happen. I, I have a personal self-interest in not having to learn how to drive. I figure if I'm super optimistic, maybe, maybe if I just hang on for like another 10 years, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Let's ask our guest. Let's ask our guest. We have the perfect guest, longtime tech journalist, a tech understander, someone who really deep delves deep into technology to understand like how things work and what's really happening. I followed his work for a long time. We're actually like we're colleagues together like 18 years ago, I think. 
at a site called Tech Dirt. Tim Lee, he is the author of the understandingai.org newsletter, longtime tech journalist, and he recently wrote a piece, The Death of Self-Driving Cars is Greatly Exaggerated. So, uh, Tim, great to have you on the show. Hey, I'm great to be on. I'm a fan of the podcast. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Let's start 10 years ago. And, you know, I think 10 years ago, there was a lot of self-driving car hype. And my impression was, and this is it's so vague and fuzzy. It's like, oh, most of it's solved, but this last part's really hard. Is that true? What was that last part that has proven to be very challenging to like turn these from like prototypes on a track or a very like organized grid-like suburb in Arizona to something that could actually be used on the road? So it is true that about 10 years ago, Google was the leading company and they had vehicles that could go on certain routes with a fair amount of kind of preparation. And about six years ago, Google rebranded itself as Waymo, its self-driving car project as Waymo, and started testing a taxi service in Phoenix. Mm. And they've been plugging away at that ever since. There were a bunch of other startups that were started between about 2014 and 2018, say. And a lot of those failed or uh, were forced to sell to some of the tech giants. And so there's many fewer companies operating in this space than there were five or six years ago. In in terms of what the last little bit is, it's just a lot of little things. I mean, this, that's right. the thing about a long tail is there's a lot of stuff out in the long tail. What One thing, for example, that Waymo and Cruz, the kind of industry leaders have been struggling with is when you deal with first responders, for example, if you come up to a, a, an active fire site, you're not supposed to dive over the hoses that firefighters are using. I mean, that's something you might only huh. encounter every 100,000 miles or something. And so there's just lots of- But it's a really big deal when Cruz, you do it. Yes, absolutely. There's another yeah. case where a cruise vehicle like drove through a uh, police tape in a crime scene. So there's lots of little things. I, I saw a headline. I haven't actually looked into this yet, but apparently a cruise like broke, drove into wet concrete. So the real world is complicated and there's just lots of weird situations that a human being, because we kind of understand how the world works, right. we see, oh, that looks like wet concrete. I shouldn't drive on that. But you just have to like, it's like whack-a-mole. You have to like hit every single like bad thing a vehicle could do it. That just takes a lot, of, a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, I don't know why, but I find all the stories of like robotic self-driving cars behaving badly absolutely hilarious. And I not mm. the ones where they hurt people. I should just caveat that. But the ones where, you know, something that we wouldn't even think about, you know, there's an object in the road, just go around it. And they seem to really struggle with. I, I want to ask you more about why that seems to be an issue and sort of get into some of the edge cases that, that Joe mentioned in the intro. But before we do... Why? Here's a basic question. Why have a lot of these self-driving car companies struggled? Because on the face of it, it, it would appear that there is a lot of money floating out there in venture capital land that often goes into um, unrealistic or unprofitable, unprofitable projects. So why has this been an issue for self-driving cars in particular? I mean, I think on some level, the basic issue is safety. A lot of other areas of tech, you kind of build a minimal viable product and you put it out in the world and, you know, it breaks sometimes, but that's fine. Like that gets you more feedback. And because you can um, kind of iterate rapidly, you can like scale up very quickly and get to mm -hmm. a profitable scale pretty quickly. That obviously doesn't work if, if the moving fast and breaking things is like literally breaking things and killing people. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very close to perfect before you can launch a commercial service and start making money. And so you had a bunch of startups that were trying to do this. They had all sorts of strategies to do that. Some were trying to operate in retirement communities or do like package delivery. They tried to find kind of less demanding applications than like drive anywhere, anytime. But it was just really, really hard. And so the companies that have uh, sustained are the ones that have Amazon, Google, GM, like big companies behind them who are willing to put like a billion dollars a year behind them for several years in a row while they kind of try to iron out these final little wrinkles. Hmm. So zooming forward to today, and that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't really thought about that. It's like for many tech, it's okay if there are edge cases where it doesn't work because you just sort of like, well, you put it out in the world and like, yeah, it's not a perfect product, but it's a minimum viable. It's free and we're refining it. It's basically. free and we're iterating, but you cannot do that when there's big safety issues. And if it, it's a threat to other drivers or pedestrians, it's not really an acceptable way to do product. Going th to today, and you are more optimistic, and we'll get to that about the prospects for their existence, but has there been a breakthrough in recent years or has it just been this slow iterative grinding away at the edge cases that makes it so that there are fewer and fewer edge cases? 
I, I would say the second one. Hmm. Um, I mean, Waymo's um, technology has worked pretty well. They started doing fully driverless operations in Phoenix in the fall of 2020 and uh, have just very gradually expanded that service. Now, Waymo, I just a, a week or two ago, they got permission from California regulators to begin operating commercially in San Francisco after a year or two of doing practice driving there. And so, yeah, they've just they've just been plugging away at it. And it's hard to tell from the outside because they're not super transparent about about all the details of you know how many incidents they have or how much work they have to do on the back end. But yeah, it seems like they're just very gradually making the technology better. And they seem to think because they're they're now talking about scaling up much more quickly. They seem to think that the companies seem to think that they're that this is ready for it to be a commercial product. Just a really simple question: If I were to go to San Francisco right now. Could I de- go there and download an app or whatever and take get a get in a self driving taxi? Like that's a thing. You know, I haven't checked that recently. So it was literally like last week or the week before the California regulators gave them permission to do that. Okay. I think and so until like last week, I think there was a waiting list. But it's definitely a case if you go to certain parts of Phoenix, um, including the Phoenix Airport, you can hail a taxi and it's just like Uber or Lyft. You can, wow. you can go try it. I want to do it. I want to do it. Tracy, let's go. Suburbs, yeah. <laughs> let's go to Phoenix just so that for the one ride, then fly back. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, and I've, I've talked that. to people there. I mean, it works. It works quite well. I mean, the people I've, I've talked to several people who have ridden in those vehicles, and at least in most rides, they say it's flawless. It drives very comfortably, and uh, yeah, the service there, there just aren't that many rough edges. Can we talk a little bit more about the edge stuff? Because my mm. my impression is that, OK, computers learn from repetition and from modeling out various scenarios. But driving is such an infinitely unpredictable experience, especially if you're in New York. It's not that hard, Tracy. You, you could, <laughs> it, get, you no, could it, get it. Like if this technology had never taken up, I have confidence you could do it. I don't know. I, I think I've missed the boat on that one. But anyway, OK, but. There are all these different possibilities that a self-driving car could be grappling with. So, for instance, an animal runs out in the middle of the street and, you know, maybe after that happens several times, the self-driving car starts to realize, well, it's this animal and then it's going to behave in this way and keep moving or stop and I need to respond to it in a certain way. But that kind of seems to be the issue here as far as I understand it. Yes, absolutely. And there's a bunch of ways that the companies have tried to do this. So, for example, Google has long had a big test track facility out in in California about an hour. I went out there a few years ago where they have some fake roads and they'll create kind of fake scenarios. They'll have cars cut each other cars off or have somebody like moving boxes across the street, people in Halloween costumes, something like that. And so they try to think of what are all the situations that a self-driving car could run into and kind of anticipate that. And this is also why they started in Phoenix is one of their strategies was, okay, there's so many edge cases, we can't do them all right at, what, all at once. And so let's start in kind of easy mode. And so Phoenix has very nice weather, nice wide streets, mm. um, well-marked, you know, not a lot of pedestrians, not a lot of bicyclists. And so that was kind of way most theory was that we'll do the easiest one first. The, the issue with that is that the economics of running a taxi service in Phoenix are not that great because most people already have cars. Um, and so Cruise has kind of had the opposite approach, which is we want to see these edge cases as fast as possible. So let's start in downtown San Francisco because that's where there's a ton of crazy situations. And so it'll kind of be harder in the first place. We'll be gathering mm-hmm. data very quickly and maybe we'll master it. And it's not yet clear yet. I mean, the, both both companies now seem to think they're ready, but I, I don't think we've, we've seen them in the wild long enough to have a sense for kind of which of those strategies are working better. But yeah, it's really tough. And, and so so I should say, like, for the first few years, both of these companies had safety drivers behind the wheel of every vehicle. And so the vehicle was mostly driving itself. But if it got stuck, the safety driver would have to um, take over. And the kind of big switching, the big risky point is when they take the first drivers out of the car, um, which Wimla did about two years ago, and Cruz did, I think, maybe a year ago. And then, you know, and then, then it's, it becomes much trickier because if the vehicle screws up, it's a it's a big deal. I love the idea of having to train the self-driving cars by, like, putting people in Halloween costumes <laughs> in front of them. And it reminds me a lot of socializing my dog because we used to have to, like, wear <laughs> weird hats, right? Or, like, bring mm. balloons into the house so that he would get used to them and not freak out. But this goes back to something um, that I mentioned earlier, which is, is the issue here the software? So, like, the actual modeling of the reaction to an unknown or unfamiliar um, event or stimulus? Or is it more on the hardware side where maybe you need better sensors that are better able to appreciate the things in front of you? 
I would say it's more software and particularly more data. But yeah, the hardware has stayed pretty constant. I mean, the, the trio of sensors most of these vehicles have are cameras, radar, and then LiDAR, which is a um, like laser rind laser range finding technology that gives you kind of a 3D map of your environment. And so 10 years ago, Google's cars had those three sensors. And I think now those sensors are better, but I don't think anybody thinks that the main issue is that we need an upgrade in the quality of the LiDAR. Really, they just need, they need examples of every possible edge case. And they, you know, it's, it's hard to get enough of that data because some edge cases happen very rarely, but can be very serious if you encounter them. Give us a quick industry overview. You know, you mentioned Waymo. It's Waymo's Google. Cruise mm -hmm. is GM. Cruise is GM, yes. And then obviously Tesla um, yeah. and Elon's, all, like, if you just, like, read Elon's Twitter feed, you would think that they've already had self-driving cars, like, in the wild. And I don't really think that's true, but I don't really understand what's going on. Can you give, like, a really just sort of quick, like, overview of who the big players are yeah. and, like, who owns them and just sort of, like, what their status is? Yes, absolutely. So Waymo is mainly owned by Google. Cruise is mainly owned by GM. I consider Tesla to be in a different market. And some of the, the huh. Tesla fans get mad at me when I say yeah. this, but Tesla is building a driver assistance product. So all pretty much any car you drive now, that has advanced cruise control where it stays in your lane and doesn't hit the car in front of you. In some ways, I think Tesla has a more advanced version of that. Although also in some ways, I think it's Elon Musk just has a low or risk tolerance. And so he's kind of pushing a technology that's anyway. But so, so but the, the key thing about the Tesla product is you are not supposed to like crawl in the backseat and take a nap. Right. You're supposed to be there making sure it doesn't break. And have Elon people crawled in the back seat and taken a nap? I'm sure somebody has. That, that there are videos of people doing inappropriate things while behind the wheel of a <laughs> Tesla, but but you're definitely not supposed to. And, and you know, the, the vehicles they, they have ways of monitoring the driver so that that doesn't happen. But anyway, so so theoretically, Elon Musk thinks they're gonna at some point get to the point where you don't have to be behind the wheel, but I do not think they're close to that or really laying groundwork. Because one of the things for any um service like that is you need an operations staff because the vehicle is occasionally gonna get stuck. And when that happens, it needs to be able to phone home and get kind of remote guidance about how to deal with it. And as far as I know, Tesla's not doing it. Anyway, so that's Tesla. And then the other two companies, there, there are a few other companies that I would say are a little behind. So Amazon has a company called Zooks. They used to be a startup, but got acquired oh, yeah. by Amazon a couple of years ago. Um, and there's a company called Motional that is also, I, I think, close to being ready for driverless, but not to driverless. And then there's a company called Mobileye that supplies the hardware for most of these driver assistance systems. And they have been working on this technology. So that's another company. But yes, I, I say those four or five companies are the kind and, of the remaining players. Am I hallucinating this memory or was there a situation in which Uber hired every single member of the Carnegie Mellon University robotics department to work on self-driving cars for them? Yes, absolutely. That, so that Uber happened? Was one, that's one, a real thing the, that actually um, happened? Yes, that was in, I mean, I don't know if it was every member, but yes, Uber hired a bunch of talent in 2016, 2017. And then one of their vehicles struck and killed somebody in Tempe, Arizona in 2018. Um, and that basically destroyed their program. And so um, I think the remnants, oh, the, so, uh, actually, I should say there's a startup called Aurora that is doing trucking. I think Uber, they, they acquired Uber's thing. But anyway, yeah, so Uber is now not a player because in large part, because they, they're the, really the only, only one of these fully self-driving programs that have had a fatality with their, huh. with their testing. So let's assume that self-driving cars become a realistic thing. How viable is that as a business model? Because mm. on a first reading, it seems extremely expensive to develop, possibly extremely expensive to maintain if you have to provide operational support to all these, you know, robot cars out in the field. And then thirdly, it does seem like there's a big regulatory slash safety slash maybe legal liability risk if something were to happen. I mean, I'm pretty optimistic about it because you think about if you think about Uber and Lyft, about half of the cost of running Uber and Lyft is the labor of the human driver. And so if you take that out, then Waymo and Cruise need to get the, the new cost, the cost of the sensors, plus whatever operational stuff in R&D to be less than half the cost of the driver. And that's a pretty significant amount of money. And so I think it'll take them a while to get to the scale where it's profitable, because certainly you know, Waymo and Cruise both have, I, I think, hundreds or maybe thousands of people working on this technology. And the sensors are currently pretty expensive. But one of the most predictable things 
in business is that mass manufactured technologies like LiDAR sensors and computer chips get cheaper at scale. And so I, I have no doubt that in the long run, this is going to be a, a viable business. And it's really, I think, a question of uh, how much patience the, the big companies backing, you know, Google, GM and uh, Amazon companies like that, how many billions of dollars they want to spend to get to this. But I think that in the long run, I think that the taxi industry will be operated by self-driving cars. And I think that in the long run, I also think it'll be cheaper and probably expand the market a lot. So I, my, my long run expectation is that this is going to be a big and profitable industry. Do you envision it just or primarily for taxis? Or could you have right. a situation but, where people like like me well, are buying self-driving cars? Well, and just to add on to Tracy's question, because this, it sort of dovetails, could Tracy drive to work? And then make some extra money by during the day when it would be parking for eight hours, have it be a taxi. And then could that impair total volume sales for the automakers? Because basically, Tracy takes her self-driving car to work. But then also is a, uh, you know, I could serving become the taxi industry a at the same time. self-driving car capitalist. Rather than having the car <laughs> sit for eight hours in the parking lot or 10 hours. Smart. Right. So I, I think certainly I think the initial product is going to be a taxi service. That's what all the people doing passenger. You know, no, nobody's talking about selling them in the short run. Okay. Obviously, people like owning cars. And so in the long run, I think there will be a business model where you'll be able to have a car. My guess is that it's going to be something more like a long term lease than actual outright ownership, but partly for liability reasons. I mean, if you imagine if you own the car and the brake needs a replacement and you don't replace it and the car crashes to kill somebody, the people who made the software are going to get sued for that. And so they're, I think they're going to be reluctant to hmm. sell people self driving cars outright, but you might be able to have something that's a long-term lease that's effectively the same as ownership. Um, I'm not sure it would make that much sense. I mean, if if you're the kind of person who wants to share a car with other people, then probably you would just take a taxi. So I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot of ways the economics could work out. My guess is that you'll have some people who will lease a a self-driving car long-term and other people who will just take taxis. And and I think that hopefully, like in the long run, if economies scale bring costs down, it'll be much cheaper than a taxi today, like roughly half the price if you figure that, that half is labor. And so then that'll allow lots of people, especially in cities, to own fewer cars and well, and take more taxi rides. But I was just going to say, even if you didn't, and I, I, mean, I know other people have said this before, but maybe Tracy doesn't want to share her car with other people during the day. But it could mm-hmm. mean less need for parking, right? The car could drive home and back, go back into your driveway or garage while you're at work. Yes. And then pick you up. Yes, and, then you d- and then the amount of space that a city or a neighborhood needs for parking probably could be significantly diminished. Yes, absolutely. And I think I think one underestimated benefit of this from an urban planning perspective is it'll be much easier to, to do congestion charging because uh-huh. the vehicles will all be up connected. And so, so I could imagine more kind of complicated pricing where you, you give people a strong incentive not to drive their car into downtown. Like if you're going to go downtown, take a taxi or maybe some kind of shared you know, vehicle. So there's a lot of, I think self-driving cars will open up a lot of new options for the way you kind of organize, especially commutes, because yeah, you can have different kinds of vehicles and different kinds of business models for how people pay for them. Could I use my self-driving car to deliver packages as a sort of gig FedEx worker or something? I hear UPS <laughs> drivers cost uh, cost a lot nowadays. So, uh, you know. Right. I mean, I, I, again, I think that'll be a, a different market. So there's a company called Neuro that is trying to do this. Uh, several companies actually, but I think they're the market leader. Um, so I think it's possible. I mean, one of the issues is, you know, with a FedEx driver, the FedEx driver physically gets out of the car, right. out of the truck and carries the package to your front door. And obviously your self-driving car is going to be able to do that. So I'm not sure exactly what that market will look like. But my guess is that there will be customized delivery vehicles that are much smaller and lighter and cheaper than a full size car, because there's no reason you need a full car if there's nobody in the vehicle. Can I ask a question about safety? You know, you mentioned that Uber's self-driving car pilot program ended basically because uh, a car struck and killed a pedestrian. It is also true that human driven cars are killing people every day. I believe there's tens of thousands of people every year die in auto accidents. Do we have meaningful apples to apple statistics or is it that still so far that the te- that the self-driving car universe is too narrow or in too ideal conditions to actually do a safety comparison? Um, it's actually just the raw number of miles is not high enough. So okay. while it's true that, that humans kill thirty four to 40,000 people a year, um, it's just a, I, I, humans that's, drive a I mean, that's a staggering number. Yes. The number of people. But humans, yeah. humans drive billions or trillions of miles every year. And so okay. it's like one, there's a fatality once every 100, 100 million 
miles mm -hmm. roughly on the roads and self-driving cars are in the tens of millions of miles. So um, if they were as safe as a human, you would expect about one less than one death so far. And so the fact that there has been only one death doesn't really tell you that much got about, it, it. you know, is it is it more or less safe? Um, I mean, so far, the Weibo and Cruise, the leaders have had zero deaths, but they've gotten less than 100 million miles. So you just, it. I think it's okay. just too, too soon to say for sure. How much does the business model or the eventual profitability of a lot of these self-driving car companies depend on the way the insurers react? Because I imagine... You know, if, if there is an accident involving a self-driving car and there's negligence involved or, you know, something's wrong with the model, the the legal liability is almost infinite at that point, potentially millions and millions of dollars of payouts if there are actual fatalities. And I, I guess my question is, a lot of this is going to depend on the insurers being willing to take on that risk, right? Yeah, you know, I'm not actually sure exactly what Google and, and Cruise's insurance situations are. I mean, they're big enough companies that I would guess they can self-insure. So that's actually not something I haven't, I, I, I assume they've disclosed in some regulatory filing how they're insured. But it's it's a different market because it's not, especially in the early years, it's not going to be individual consumers buying insurance. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm not actually sure what the, the structure of that market is right mm -hmm. now and, and whether they have third-party insurance or they're just on the hook for the liability. That'd be interesting to look at, yeah. Can I just ask a really simple regulatory question? Right now, if a, one of these companies said, we're good, we got it, you want to get a taxi at, or you want to do Cannonball Run, and you want to go coast to coast, we'll drive you from New York to California. Could they legally do it? Or have, is there still some sort of like regulatory blessing that would need to happen for that to exist? There's very little regulation at the federal level. There's some regulation of the design of the vehicle. For example, you still need to have a steering wheel in the car. But at the federal level, I don't think there'd be any legal barriers to do that. At the state level, it's state by state. I think if you weren't challenge if you weren't charging for it and just doing it as a demonstration, I don't think there'd be any issue in most states. But as I mentioned, so California, I think, is one of the states that regulates these things more heavily, and they do have a fairly substantial process. They treat Way one cruise similarly to the way Uber and Lyft are regulated, and they just got the approval to to start doing commercial taxi rides in San Francisco. So yeah, it's state by state, and Phoenix, I believe, there's there's close to no regulation of of that kind of thing. So yeah, and I think Texas is probably similar. So the the more kind of Republican leaning states, there's very little regulation. California has some, but but not enough that it's really, I think, a, a major problem. So we discussed that there are some self-driving cars available out there, but they're kind of a novelty slash experiment at the moment. How will we know when self-driving mm. cars are a sort of viable, realistic thing? What are you watching out for? I think they're running the experiment right now. So Cruise has announced, I think, eight to 10 new cities, mostly in the Southwest, places like um, Houston, Dallas, Miami, Atlanta, Nashville. And we'll just kind of have to see how quickly that happens or if it happens. I mean, it certainly wouldn't be the first time that a company has made an announcement in the self-driving space that hasn't panned out. But they've gone from just Phoenix to now Phoenix and San Francisco. And I think anyway, so so we'll just have to watch and see if those announcements actually turn into operating services. Like, like I said, right now you can go to Phoenix, you can try it. I think in the next few weeks or months, you'll be able, anybody will be able to hail a car in San Francisco. Um, and then the other thing is the service territory. So right now it's not all of the Phoenix metro area. It's um, I think a couple hundred square miles. And so, yeah, you'll we'll, we'll want to watch which cities are they going into and how big of a service footprint and do the, does that service footprint grow over time. And then ultimately, we'll have to see the financial results. I mean, these are both publicly traded companies. So eventually, I assume they'll tell us if it's profitable. I don't think it is yet. But yeah, I, I think if you see them rapidly scaling up the number of vehicles and the number of cities, then that'll be a sign that it's going well. And if it's if it doesn't, then it probably isn't going as well. I'm not kidding, by the way, about going to Arizona just to try because we we already want to do an Arizona tour anyway with all of our land and water and alfalfa and chips episodes we do there. So we got to fly there just to take a self-driving car. I just have like one more question. And it's basically, you know, here in New York, I don't think there's anything, but let's put a real time frame on this. Like you say, like, you know, you say they're coming. We're going to start seeing them more and more in some of these other cities. When can we say like, you know, when will we have them in New York? And- 
give us a year by which we could say, okay, Tim was right or Tim was wrong. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm, make, if I'm making a strong prediction yeah. that, you know, that on a specific year. So I will say what, what Waymo and Cruz have said, I believe Waymo has said they're planning to increase their footprint by 10 X um, by the end of next year. Wow. And Cruz has says they're going to reach a billion dollars in revenue, which I think wow. will be about a 50 X increase by 2025. So I'm I'm a little skeptical to hit those numbers, but that's that's the scale they're talking about. Now that would still be a small fraction of the overall taxi industry. Sure. Um, and I think one of the things you'll see is that they haven't entirely figured out the weather situation, and, and also that to some extent the like really dense infrastructure. So if this question of when will you be able to ha- hail a vehicle in Manhattan, I could still see that being five to ten years away. But I would not be surprised if. Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, Miami, those kind of cities, you know, southwestern kind of suburban cities, if three to five years from now, it's very common to see self-driving taxis as as just like on par with Uber and Lyft in terms of popularity. Tim Lee, we'll uh, have you back in five years and we'll uh, see if all of this borne out. Really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Sounds good. Thank you. telling you, Tracy, it always comes back to Arizona for us. Chips. <laughs> Seriously. We we're getting chips, water, alfalfa, and, and now self-driving, self-driving cars. cars. Yeah. Okay. I'm serious. It's not that this many the most, things. What but... other state to inter- intersects with? I'm telling you, we got to take a trip. I'm not being facetious. <sighs> okay. Well, I would happily go to Arizona. I think that'd be fun. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier, which is like self-driving cars at once feel far away and very close and sort of inevitable and also quite difficult, if that makes sense. You know what I thought was really fascinating, and I hadn't really appreciated this, his point about one of the companies starting in Phoenix where the driving is super easy and then you sort of like progressively get better to go to more complicated places. And then the other one starting or mainly operating in San Francisco where the driving is really difficult. And it's like, if you can master San Francisco, you can probably master anyway. I wonder what the better approach is, like getting progressively, you know, progressively better or just like really taking all the hard stuff on day one. Well, you know what I don't get? Just thinking about that conversation. You know how all the CAPTCHAs to identify robots are like, identify the motorcycles in this photo or identify the buses. That doesn't bode well for self-driving cars, does it? Wait, why, why? Well, because it seems like robots struggle to identify motorcycles on the road oh. and humans don't. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Right. Like our whole approach to even identifying whether someone is it's a human always or not. traffic lights yeah, it's always or traffic cars lights. or motorcycles. So yeah, maybe maybe yeah. actually self-driving cars are ultimately a threat to our existing CAPTCHA systems. That's, wow. Yeah, right. Like if we could solve self, self-driving <laughs> cars, that guarantees that we're going to have spam and other Internet attacks. That's right. I hadn't really thought about that. Well, I mean, I think we didn't touch on it much there, but there are also obviously societal implications of this. We talked a little bit about the notion that, well, maybe companies could just replace all the taxi or the Uber drivers, maybe even some mail delivery drivers um, get replaced. That seems to be an issue as well. And then the other thing. Actually, I want to look into this after this conversation, but I am really curious what the insurance is like on these things and who's providing Yeah, who has to pay and how. I do think there are a lot of big questions like that or like who's ultimately responsible when when these malfunction. I think in San Francisco recently, there was something where a bunch of them all shut down at the same time and they create all these traffic problems, which is also not something that comes up with human drivers. I also think like the political debates are going to get like super weird. Like, Mm. what if they say, well, you know, because Tim mentioned congestion taxes. Mm -hmm. What if they say, oh, like, you can't even do that route because the computer has determined that that would, like, use too much energy. Could it end? Oh, interesting. Could, like, you know, and you... It's interesting, like the red states, as you mentioned, have been a bit more liberal about allowing them. But then there's all in 20 years, will you be allowed to be a human driver? Will you allowed to be like go sightseeing, like all these things, like kind of some like big, interesting questions that could reshape society. And then the reshaping, like sort of of our physical space, maybe less need for parking. If these actually take off, I think like it will change the world in ways we don't really anticipate. Yeah, maybe we need to do a self-driving cars episode from the perspective of a city planner or something Oh, that's a good idea. That'd be interesting. Yeah. All right, well, shall we leave it there for now? Let's leave it there. Okay.
And this has been another episode of the All Thoughts Podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Jill Weisenthal. You can follow me at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Tim Lee. He's at Binary Bits. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Arman and Dashiell Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts under the handle at Podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we have a transcript, we have a blog and a newsletter. And check out the Discord. We have a transportation and an AI channel in there. So people will be talking about this episode. Go in there, hang out with other listeners 24-7, discord.gg slash Odd Lots. And if you enjoy Odd Lots, if you like hearing our thoughts about self-driving cars, then please leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.